I'm Evelyn Kalp, interviewing her. Welcome to Abby's History Bites, hosted by Martha Owen, the Heritage Collection Manager at the Evelyn Lehman Kalp Heritage Collection at the Napanee Center. Welcome to another episode of Evie's History Bites. I'm your host, Martha, and I'm glad that you're joining us. We have Police Chief Steve Ruley and Emergency Services Chief Don Lehman on the podcast talking about the Napanee Police Department and Napanee's Emergency Services. But before we get to them, let's have a little history lesson. Napanee's first arrest was on July 15th, 1889, when John Coppus was arrested for running his horse too fast. The irony of that situation was John Coppus was elected the first fire chief on July 8, 1892. Napanee first had a constable, and in 1881, a night watchman was added. The night watchman really only shook doors to make sure that they were locked, and it really wasn't known what else he did. Law enforcement fell to the constable and his powers to deputize his posse. Napanee purchased a metal calaboose in 1890, which a calaboose is a movable jail. And when the constable and later police department moved to a different building, the calaboose moved too. It was used until 1972, and it is a part of the heritage collection on loan from the police department. In 1899, a town marshal became an elected official, and he had a broad responsibility, from arresting drunks and disorderlies, to herding escaped cows, hogs, and chickens, inspecting privies, and at the time, the occasional larger crimes that he dealt with that included burglary, theft, and safe blowers. When Napanee became a city in 1925, the police department was formed, and the police of the chief of police was appointed. For the first 18 years of Napanee, uh, they had really very little fire protection. In June of 1892, two hose carts were purchased for $80 each, and on July 8, 1892, two companies of 20 men were formed, and John Coppice was elected as the fire chief. The first fire of the fire department came before the waterworks was completed, and so the fire department had to continue with the bucket brigade. The first fire bell had been on top of the corner hardware in the center of town, and that bell is on display along with the calaboose in the Heritage Collection. In 1926, the first electric siren was installed above the uh, telephone exchange. The hose carts went by the names of Goodwill No. 1 and Rescue No. 2, which Rescue No. 2 is also on display in the Heritage Collection. The era of the hose carts ended in 1916, and in 1919, the town purchased a motorized fire truck. One of Napanee's most memorable fires happened on January 17, 1937, when the Napanee Auditorium burned down. When we get to the interview with uh, Chief Lehman, you'll actually hear a story about Evie and her husband Fred that pertains to the burning down of the auditorium. Many raced from surrounding areas because they heard that Napanee was ablaze. In 1965, the Napanee Fire Department became known as the Napanee Smoky Stovers. Police Chief Steve Ruley sat down with me and talked about the Napanee Police Department. All right, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, so, uh, Chief Ruley, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, my name is uh, Steve Ruley. I've been with the Napanee Police Department for 21 years. Um, I have four children. I have two in college, one in high school, one in middle school. So, needless to say, uh, home life is busy. <laughs> Um, I've been married for uh, 22 years to kind of my high school uh, sweetheart we met in youth group so when we were about 16 so um, yeah that's kind of me and kids in a nutshell (laughs) 
so what inspired you to be a police officer? Well, that's interesting because um, I do get a lot of looks when people ask, you know, what I took in college. I actually went to college for motion picture and video production. Oh, wow. So I wanted that to be the, the rest of my life. I was going to make movies, videos. That was kind of my... Always had an interest in it since a, a young age, and I thought that is going to be what I what I did. Um, my wife was eight months pregnant with our, our firstborn, my daughter, and my parents were taking my wife and I to kind of a celebratory lunch in Chicago. It's there's a restaurant on the 95th floor of the John Hancock Building, so oh. they wanted to do this this really neat. Uh, lunch for us. The date, September 11th, 2001. Oh, wow. So we're on the outskirts of Chicago, and I remember whatever radio station we were listening to, the, the news had broke in what was happening you know, that day. And I think everybody probably has their own personal story of where they were on that day. Um, I just remember very vividly the, the, it happening, and then pretty soon they closed down all the skyscrapers in Chicago, we couldn't go to lunch, so I remember us stopping at just a little Italian place. I remember everybody in that restaurant just being glued to the TV, as I'm sure everybody was across the country that day, but just kind of watching those events unfold, and I just kind of felt this this real jerk that I should do something. You know, my parents always told me that there's two kinds of people in this world, people that complain and people that actually do something about it, so... With some newfound inspiration of what kind of world will this place be for my daughter to grow up in, mm-hmm. I I decided to, that I was going to do something like public safety. So um, that's kind of yeah what led me to to go this direction. Wow, that that's really inspiring. I have chills now. <laughs> Tell us um, a little bit about the Napanee Police Department. So, um, I guess when I first came on, about 21 years ago, there was 15 officers. The department of 15 officers, and um, we had just, the department had just started an SRO program. So that was kind of the new big thing when I got on the, the SRO program and having someone initially in the school, and that, that's kind of um, what it started off as. Um, then the department kind of progressed and got bigger, and over time I was no longer the young person. I remember being very young, and some of the old guys wouldn't talk to me yet because <laughs> I was too new. Then as time went on, um, it started to sink in that I'm not the I'm not the new guy anymore. I'm the old guy. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of getting off track there, but... Um, yes. So just different things with the with the department. I think um, we've seen a lot of change. Um, people retire, new people come on. Um, I think we saw the department kind of change under uh, Mayor Jenkins, as far as kind of the direction and maybe some some mission and goals for what we were hoping to accomplish. Um, so a lot of positive, you know, just trying to, to update some things with uh, the times. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, mm-hmm. without going into great detail, there's a lot of... <laughs> there's a lots of nuts and bolts to it, isn't Yes, there? yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, like, how many officers do you have, and do you have any canines right now? So, officers, um, since we just added the SROs to the SRO program, which now we have four SROs in our schools, that took our um, numbers to 21. So we have 21 um, we have eight reserves, and we do have one canine. His name is Bain, mm-hmm. and right now he is on afternoon shift with Sergeant Live and Good. So okay. they're kind of partners. I think he's been on the road now for uh, a couple years and just working hard, and mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going well. Yeah, and you kind of touched on the SRO program and the student, or the yeah, this uh, school resource officer program. Um, how, and you were one of the first, I think when I graduated, I think it might've been officer Belasa was our school resource officer. Okay. Yes. Um, 
which I, I graduated in 2005, but you were, you were kind of after that. So how has that program evolved? Oh boy, I think that um, initially, the program was designed, what they were hoping was to have an officer in the school. Um, it's kind of un, in uncharted territory as far as putting an officer in there and, and the pros, the cons. Some people felt good about it. Some people felt bad about it. Um, I think that people thought it was to put an officer in there to, you know, catch the kids type of thing. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes there were kids that felt that way, that that was the, the nature of the program. So I think initially the, the program kind of felt like it was that way. It, it, it's kind of evolved more into a a resource, you know, where they're kind of mm -hmm. serving as a, a counselor. Uh, you know, I, I know that they're helping kids with homework and they're helping them, you know, run programs and events and... Um, they're kind of, they're a great liaison to the administration. I mean, I'm shocked what some of those kids will tell the SRO and not tell administration, just because they've kind of uh, worked on that relationship for so long where mm -hmm. the, the students feel like they have a, uh, someone they can trust. Yeah. So, and I think that they see them more as a resource than, oh, this person's here to, you know, bust us, like, they truly want to help, you know, and mm -hmm. I think when I was there, that was the same mindset where I didn't want to be the, the, the gotcha moment, the aha, like, I'm not waiting for you to mess up, I'd love mm -hmm. to give you 10 pep talks yeah. before you mess up, so we don't have to go there, so I always thought of that job as more of the uh, preventative maintenance, you know, if we can reach some of these kids mm -hmm. beforehand, we won't be dealing with them later type of thing. So yeah. you really saw that program evolve even more so with some unfortunate recent tragic events. You know, we want the SRO to be more than, oh, we want a hired gun in the school. That's not the case, you know, and, and while that might seem like the most obvious answer, but that's not what we want to be known for. Yes, if it gets bad, that's what it, you know, will be. But we want it to be more than that where they're really trying to, to – reach our youth and you know help our youth and help them get through those years those very impressionable years where it can make all the difference mm -hmm. yeah. I, I'm a little jealous that y'all have Mac in the schools <laughs> now <laughs> so that uh, when Mac visits the station mm -hmm. Mac always comes in my office to <laughs> find me and sit down and I'm always worried because you know he's trained to sense when someone's under stress so yeah. I always will ask, you know, Skyler, like, hey, can, did he, does he come over to me because he can sense that I'm stressed? Or <laughs> he just kind of laughs, but he's just, he's a great dog, so. Yeah. Um, so what is the future for the police department? Well, I think the future, you're going to see us shift some gears, sort of, in the sense of investigations. So mm -hmm. what I feel... Well, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have said that we would never go this direction, but it's going to happen where so much stuff and crime and information happens via digitally. So cybercrime, you know, so like a cyber investigator, our two full-time investigators now are detectives. You know, if I had to break down how much time they spend on investigations that involve everything cyber whether mm -hmm. it be fraud whether it be security issues whether it be th threats on facebook or social media or any other platform or that there's just so much that um, happens i really think in the future we're going to have a cyber investigator that basically will imagine a detective that never leaves the building okay i mean they're just really going to have to because i really think we're to the point where we can keep someone busy full time with as much stuff that happens online and cell phones and there's just so much to it mm -hmm. I think that's probably going to be the the biggest change and I think that we're always I guess on the road side or the patrol side we're kind of a, a reactive department anyways where we're, we're kind of called when needed so mm -hmm. we notice a, a trend when uh, 
things change. You know, there's always kind of like the, I don't want to say the crime of the year, but it kind of comes in waves with, you know, it'll kind of be drugs for a little bit. Maybe it'll be some thefts for a little bit or auto thefts or, you know, we kind of adapt with those as some of those needs uh, change. But, uh, yeah, those are some of the things that are going to happen in the future. Okay. And off the top of your head, because I know I'm putting you on the spot with this, but would you happen to know any of your statistics of, like, calls or investigations? So I do know. So after I put out, um, we do submit monthly statistics to uh, the city council. So Mm -hmm. they can just kind of see where we're at. I do know that as of last year, not last year, last month for the month of August, for whatever reason, we set a record as far as calls for service per the month. We're almost right at 1,000. Oh, wow. So most people, they would kind of guess and wonder what we, so that's 1,000 calls for service. So that's 1,000 people in the month of August that have picked up the phone and needed the needed the police in, in one sense or another so it's uh, those statistics as far as uh, investigations it really again some of those are driven by uh, just things that come in so mm-hmm. sometimes there's a lot of investigations or active cases that the detectives are working on I do know that there is and you'll probably read about it soon but one of our detectives detective Havert has been working on a cold case that is over 20 years old that we're making some some groundbreaking things on and it may come to a to a close here soon so that'll be a big thing for him and when everybody gets to hear about it it'll be they'll be most amazed at how he has worked on that kind of with the homicide unit and stuff like that over the Mm -hmm. last few years so that's going to be another big uh, a big thing coming out as as far as stats that we don't really hear about or know yeah Um, um, stats for training hours, you know, how many hours of training the guys are receiving, how many hours we're, we're actually teaching for ourselves or other agencies. Um, code enforcement, there's a whole bunch of different stats that uh, mm-hmm. we kind of <laughs> put together. It's a lot of numbers, and the, it, it does help us with some things as far as what we're seeing the most of. You know, we kind of try to predict into the future, you know, mm-hmm. we can adjust some patrols or we can adjust some things based on numbers that we see or trends that we can identify, um, especially with like traffic patterns or traffic things. We use our speed sign a lot for that, you know, as far as like targeted areas that we want to pay attention to. So, yeah. Pretty cool. And I, I, I love cold cases, so I'm really excited for what, what, off the, or what Detective Havert has on his plate. So. Yeah, it's going to be... It's going to be a pretty interesting press release when that happens. <laughs> All right, so I don't know if you can talk about him or not, but what are some memorable calls for you? Um, I think some of the memorable calls. Um, unfortunately, I, I when I went to the Academy, you know, I feel like the Academy prepared you for just about just about anything that you'd come across. The one thing that they didn't prepare you for was going to your first death scene. So unfortunately, some of the first memories I have of calls or, you know, things that I can remember were, you know, accidents or things where unfortunately, you know, people passed or um, even the harder ones where children were involved. You know, that was, Mm -hmm. some of those were, were, I guess rough and you know I'll remember those for probably for the you know rest of my life um other things I guess more lighthearted. uh the one thing that I will never forget and right when I say that I've seen everything someone will surprise me <laughs> but uh, most people would be amazed what really happens you know after 10 o'clock and you know it, it didn't happen any, I'll never forget one time being called to a call in reference to a neighborhood dispute where a particular female subject was upset that the neighborhood was talking trash about her dog. 
Oh, wow. So she felt like the rumor mill around the neighborhood was that her dog was not well behaved. And she felt like this information was getting to some new neighbors and were basically giving her dog a, uh, a bad image. And it wasn't fair to the dog that they were talking trash about the dog. And this went on for a while and I, I hadn't been uh, trained how to handle that as far as what the, uh, you know, talking trash about a dog. But that always stuck with me. I thought, wow, I... And I was younger, so I thought, wow, uh-huh. I've heard it all. And then and, you know, <laughs> someone, something, somewhere proved me wrong, but I hadn't seen everything. So that's one of the ones I, I'll remember forever. Wow, I, I wouldn't have ever thought of somebody reporting and talking trash about a dog. <laughs> and I learned that people call 911 for all kinds of reasons. We'll call 911 to ask what time fireworks are. Mm-hmm. Um, 911 if they're out of milk. <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's all kinds of them that I would have never guessed that that's what people call for. But yeah, uh, I I always thought think that it's weird that we get phone calls asking if they can have chickens in city limits. But I mean, 911 calls got us be. <laughs> and yeah, and some of the stuff they'll ask is. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. It, it's pretty interesting. Um, you, this probably doesn't happen to you guys, but have you ever gotten any calls from, like, Napanee, Ontario? Like, because we have, like, of looking for, like, different stores and things like that. Absolutely. So that's kind of funny. So Napanee, <laughs> Ontario, our sister city, um, we, we get calls so much from Napanee, Ontario, our secretary actually has a button programmed in her phone to transfer it straight to Napanee, Ontario PD. Oh, wow. So numerous times a week, we'll get a call. They'll be Mm -hmm. kind of upset. Hey, you know, I'm out here on 429. I need an officer. And we'll, no, we don't have a 429. Well, what happened? Well, I hit a moose. (laughs) You probably want (laughs) Napanee, Ontario, Canada. So... We'll transfer it up there, and usually by the nature of the call, we can we can tell or streets that don't make sense. So, yeah, they're pretty quick about. Are you in the U.S. or are you in Canada? Because you know when they go to Google it, ironically, if you you know Google Napanee Police Department, we come up before oh. Napanee Ontario. So they just click it. They don't pay attention to area code or from their cell phone, especially especially with you know it didn't used to happen twenty years ago. Uh-huh. We didn't get calls. Yeah. Now that everything's, you know, on your cell phone, you're looking and you just hit call because you don't pay long distance anymore. Mm-hmm. And they just call and, yeah, ironically, it's not it's not for us. Yeah. And we've talked to some of the officers in Ontario, Canada, to, to see if they get any calls for us, and they don't. Huh. So. I, I wonder if it's because, um, like, in Napanee, Ontario, they have, like, greater Napanee. So, I don't... That's really interesting. I I wouldn't imagine that you guys would have gotten that, get that many calls from them. But yeah, we do so so many that she has a transfer button straight to them (laughs) because it happens quite a bit. So I feel like we should send them an invoice for (laughs) basically dispatching for them since we feel so many calls for them. That that's really interesting. So. Uh, we, we've talked about a lot of stuff. Is there anything that you wanted to add that we might not have talked about? Oh, boy. Um, I guess I would just add that um, I want people to know that we've got really good, we've got really good people over there. We've got really good officers, officers that really care about this community and the job that they do. Um, you know, I'm I'm fortunate enough to to lead them, but we've got some just great people. You know, I we're very picky on who we choose and why we choose them, and I feel like we're uh, in a great spot where almost every other department is hurting for people, and and we're not. We're full. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's people that are waiting to come. So I feel like we have a good. 
a good thing going and I, you know I just want people to I guess rest easy that the the people in the middle of the night are you know doing their job and working hard so people can sleep and, and not have to worry about some of the things that uh, go on you know and again I just I can't I can't thank the city enough for the opportunity to do this and lead the department and it truly has been one of the highlights of my life you know I didn't mm -hmm. um, grow up here I didn't come here you know I told you the story earlier of wanting to get into this yeah I went around and asked some friends where I should go some people I trusted um, in fact people from other departments that told me at the time you know 20 some years ago if you could go if they could go anywhere they'd go to Napanee and I've and I had never heard of the place really so I came down here I laughed to this day because on my application I misspelled Napanee <laughs> with so many N's and A's and P's and E's I, yeah. I misspelled it but I knew after I met people and talked to people from here that I wanted to be here even though I couldn't spell it I wanted to be here in the worst way and mm -hmm. uh, they gave me a, a, a chance you know and, and now I'm lucky enough to be to be running the place so yeah. you know Coming from, I didn't know how to spell it, to, you know, the chief of the department was a, a long trip, but it's, I sure wouldn't trade it for, for anything. So I, I thank you for the opportunity and I love doing what I do. Yeah, well, thank you so much for your service with the police department and thank, thank you, you so much for sitting down with me. Um, I truly appreciate it and I appreciate all the work that the police department is doing. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Emergency Services Chief Don Lehman sat down with me and talked about Napanese Emergency Services and the Fire Department. So Don, thank you so much for being on our podcast with me. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay, um, I'm Don Lehman. Um, lived here, we moved to Napanee when I was 10 years old. Um, Grew up here most of my life. Consider Napanee um, my hometown. Um, love Napanee. Um, just appreciate serving Napanee as the fire chief. Um, joined the fire department in 1981, same year that I was married. So today is my uh, 41st anniversary. Oh. So um, my wife and I have uh, four kids and we have five grandkids. So um had breakfast with a couple of the grandkids that were home over the weekend from iowa they moved out to iowa about a little over a year ago so they came home they were home this weekend and uh, went out for breakfast with them before they took off and um, looked at my wife and i said 41 years ago do you think we'd be sitting around the table for breakfast with a bunch of grandkids and time goes fast <laughs> yeah yeah um, so you said that you got involved with the fire department in 1981. Um, so why, why did you get involved with the fire department? Um, growing up as a kid, um, obviously, you know, I watched emergency on TV, thought, hey, that would be really cool. But back then, you know, that show was out in California and they didn't have that stuff here. So it just, it never crossed my mind. Um, after I graduated from uh, high school, um, my mom and dad were, had some friends that they would always go camping with, and he was a volunteer fireman from Napanee here, and um, asked me if I ever considered being a firefighter, and I said, not really, and he said, uh, well, think about it. So I did, and uh, filled out an application, and at that time they told me he said don't, don't be discouraged because sometimes it's a little bit difficult to get on the department and uh it wasn't very much longer that i got the phone call came up and did the interview and i was became a member of the fire department oh, cool. uh so in what year did you become the fire chief oh boy um i think it was probably in the the mid uh 90s 
At that time, um, I was still a volunteer department, and um, I was elected as the fire chief at that time. I served um, in that capacity for five years, and um, then at that time, it was that was the maximum that you could serve. And um, I was out a few years, and then I became fire chief again, and then that um, in turn rolled into a full-time position when I became um, an employee of the city. I started off in the zoning and planning department, and um, that role um, sort of turned into a full-time fire chief from the mayor, which was Mayor Thompson at that time. All right. So... The Napanee Fire Department is really unique, as uh, you guys are known as the Napanee Smoky Stover. So can you tell me a little bit about Smoky Stover and why you guys are called the Smoky Stovers? Sure. Um, it goes back, there was a cartoonist in Napanee. Um, my age is catching up with me. It was Bill Hold, Holden? Holman. Holman. Yeah. Bill Holman was, he was, uh, he grew up, he was born here in Napanee, uh, grew up a few years of his younger life in Napanee, and uh, he always wanted to be a fireman, but he wasn't able to for some reason, so, but he started drawing cartoons of uh, a, a spoof of a fireman called Smokey Stover, and um through the years that became syndicated and it became a comic strip in all the Sunday newspapers all across the nation from New York to California and I believe if you go on the internet all you got to do is just uh, type in Smokey Stover and I think you can still see some of those those comic strips and um, he was a friend he, he was a very good friend of one of the former mayors at that time and um, I think it was about the time that we moved into the station at um, City Hall, or they were building the station. I think it was in the late 1960s, and we've got we've got a uh, a letter, a handwritten letter. I don't know if it's a copy or if it's the original, but there's a handwritten letter from Bill Holman to that mayor, um, indicating that if the fire department wanted to adopt the Smokey Stover as their mascot logo that he would give them the rights to do that and so we did at that time decide to do that and um, from that point on all the uh, all the fire trucks on the logos on the the fire trucks were painted Smokey Stover and the unique thing about that is over the years, we've as we would replace the trucks, we would get different uh, artists to come in. And each one of the trucks are hand-painted. Oh, wow. They, they are not stickers. They are all hand-painted. So each one of the different artists that came in and did that had their own little flair that they <laughs> did with those smoky stovers. So... Um, there isn't one single Smoky Stover logo that's painted on the truck that's the same. So, and I think uh, somebody asked me just the other day how many different artists have painted on there, and we think that there may have been about four or five different people that have painted Smoky Stover, maybe even six oh, wow. different people that have painted Smoky Stover on the trucks. Yeah, I, I knew that each one of them was different, but I didn't know the story behind it. That's really cool. Um, so in the past couple of years, your job has kind of changed, and the fire department and EMS mm -hmm. have merged. So how has that really changed your job within the department? Oh, um, well, it was just a little over a year ago that uh, Jim Sumter, well, uh, Mayor Jenkins had been talking to both uh, former um EMS chief Jim Sumter and I about combining the two departments together and um, we were sort of working working on that together and Jim sort of retired on us and threw a little bit of a curveball to us um, and at that point then the mayor 
I was in the planning and zoning department at that time and um, and also the fire chief. So the mayor uh, asked me to come into his office and explain to me what was going on and gave me the choice. Do I want to consider being in the planning department or do I want to go full time on the fire department? And it took me about two seconds to answer that question back that my heart is in the fire department so mm -hmm. from that point on we started working on um, merging the fire department and the EMS department together under under the Napanee fire department and um, we've been working on that a little over a year awesome um, so what is what is the future for the fire department um, the future of the fire department is um, we're we're working on getting some full-time firefighter paramedics um, full-time we've we've hired um, two of them so far um, the future of the fire department is we are in the beginning stages of we've definitely outgrown both the EMS department and the fire department so mm -hmm. um, to make this work um, to bring the de both departments together under one roof is about the easiest way to make this work. There's a lot of issues that we have to work through, but I think once we get in one station and we're both working together on a daily basis, that that we can start moving in that direction and getting things um, working together as one department. So right now the uh, EMS division, if you might say, is working mm -hmm. out of the old EMS station and the fire department is working out of the fire department that's attached to city hall so i don't know um there's there's a lot of talk about where the fire station is going to go but um there's they're they're working on it and we're trying to find a good location for it and we've had a study done that's indicated approximately uh what location it should be in but we haven't moved forward and haven't made any permanent decisions on where that fire department where that fire station is going to go okay. um, so what are some memorable calls if you can share any or recall any oh boy um <laughs> oh th there's a lot of memorable calls um I'll tell you what the guys and and gals on the department are great it's it's always a fun time you just never know what's gonna come up there's some pretty funny stuff that comes up and I remember one time this goes back to when I was just pretty young on the fire department we had a house fire and um, the owner of that home was really trying to help us and we we pulled up we pulled the line the hose lines off the truck and we were going inside to fight the fire and the homeowner just thought that and i'm sure he thought that he was just helping but he really wasn't and he had a fire extinguisher and he was going to go in and try to help us put that fire out <laughs> with that fire extinguisher and the fire chief at that time took the fire extinguisher out of his hands and said we don't need your help and he threw that thing clear across the road so. <laughs> That was one memorable one. Um, there's just just some of the things that that come up are just sometimes they're just pretty funny. So the guys around the fire they'll they'll start talking every once in a while, especially when new people come on the department. We get new members and we'll sit around after a call and remember back when and you know remember when so-and-so did this or so-and-so did that and that was one of them that I can think of right away yeah so um I I doubt you guys do this anymore but when the fire department like started out they would like the fire the firemen would only get paid like a dollar a year or something mm -hmm. but then they would get fined 25 cents if they didn't attend the fire Hey, that's a good idea. Maybe we should start that again. Yeah. <laughs> twenty-five cents would be about twenty-five dollars today, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so, is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we really didn't talk about? 
actually, you know, I can go back and I can start talking about the merging of, of the department. Um, we were a volunteer department, and uh, in, in my opinion, I would like for it to remain mm -hmm. um, mostly a volunteer department. Obviously, you know, with, with the way things have changed, and when I first came on the department, um, if, if you didn't make a, phone, a fire call, you, you better have a really good reason. Well, as times change and generations change, um, I, I understand family is important, and um, there's just a lot of other activities that involve families, and um, sometimes families take precedence, and I, I totally get that. Um, but um, we'd still like to have it remain a volunteer department, and as long as we can. But during the day, with with people and their jobs and the commitments that they have to their jobs, it's a little bit difficult to get some of those people to make calls during the day and that's the reason why we're going with some full-time guys so that we can guarantee the citizens of Napanee that they can get the best fire service and get the best response that they can from the fire department by putting full-time people on that that can respond during the day and um, we've hired some good people and and they're doing a really good job and um, we like like I said, um, that's not to put anything down on the volunteers because those guys are are great. They know their stuff. Um, they train every other Wednesday, the first and third Wednesday of each month. We go through training, and um, we've been training with both fire and EMS and combining those trainings together and um, making Napanee Fire Department the best department that we can make. And um, it's my intention to keep the volunteers on as long as we can. Right. And how many volunteers would you say that you have on the department? Um, all combined, we have uh, 40. There's, there, we have about 40 members on the department. Wow. That's, so. that's a lot. And you have two stations, right? You have the one that's connected to City Hall and then another one elsewhere? Well, when we merge now, we say that we have three stations. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. we have the main station that's that's connected to City Hall, and then we have the station that the ambulances are running out of across the street from City Hall. And then um, down on Wabash Street, we do share some of the, that, the street department's facility. There are two trucks down there that we normally have down on the south side of Napanee on the south side of the tracks, so the railroad tracks. All right. Um, so is there anything else? Not unless you have anything you want me to say. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I, um, I do say I do appreciate the fire department still having, like, a lot of the records of the fires from, like, previous and it's a lot of fun reading through them like the kids who lit the couch on fire in like the 1930s or something like yep. that and yeah we do have a, a history of a lot of the fire calls back and it's really interesting to go back through through those records um all the fire calls it goes way back to oh boy i don't even know i know there's some of them in the 1940s and stuff that there's records of it. It was all handwritten, and yeah. and they're in log books, and uh, it shows the records of who was there and gives estimated damages of, of that. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, the the big one that's in those records that um, I enjoyed reading about was the auditorium. Yeah, yeah. So it it's nice to have that record of it. Yeah, there, there's sort of a funny story that goes along with that one, and, and it goes back to Evelyn Wayman Call. <laughs> so uh, Fred, her husband, was uh, a member of the department, 50, a 50-year 50 member of the department, and um, the night that the auditorium burnt down, he was uh, away on his honeymoon, and he says he never <laughs> forgave her for that because he missed the biggest fire in Napanee's history. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was able to when I came on the department. Fred was Fred was still on the department, so I got to serve with Fred a few years before he retired. So, 
Yeah, that that's one of my most favorite Fred and em- Evelyn uh, stories is when they were on their honeymoon and he missed out on the auditorium fire. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. That was that was talked about. And so it's it's still talked about in the fire station every once in a while. So. <laughs> And you've had bigger fires since the auditorium fire. Um, you've had the Fairchild Building. The Fairchild Building, yep. Yeah, that was a really cold January fire. And we've got some pictures of that that people don't believe us when we talk about it. But we've got pretty good evidence of it. And uh, there's some pictures of the trucks all iced up. And um, actually during that time we had to bring the trucks back and we had to put auxiliary heat in the building because the trucks when they came in the furnaces couldn't keep up with the the <laughs> ice and everything on the trucks it still stayed pretty cold in the station so we had to bring in some salamanders and some auxiliary oh, heat to wow. heat the station up to melt that off so wow. we didn't think that we had damaged any trucks during that fire but then after we got them thawed out and started working with the trucks well there were some lines that froze up on them nothing really serious but Mm -hmm. there were some things that we had to do to fix the trucks back up yeah and you kind of mentioned like the volunteers work during the day and um they have to come from their jobs for fire calls and um we have the the mutchler whistle that was on top of the factory and we've actually had people tell us that it not only, um, they not only blew it in the morning for lunch to come back from lunch and at the end of the day, but they also blew it for fire calls mm-hmm. so that the workers knew that there was a fire call. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know about that, but I do know that um, there was... When I first got on the department, just to let everybody know that there was a fire, that there it was tied into our dispatch at that time. Napanee at that time was dispatching their own police and fire and ambulance calls. And we had our own dispatch center there at City Hall. And there was a siren just right outside. Matter of fact, the siren is still up on the pole today. <laughs> but um, when there was a fire call, the the siren would blow and everybody knew that there was a fire call and and we were gonna run out on a fire call. Mm -hmm. So I remember that was a pretty controversial time when we switched dispatches and um, county took over dispatch that they didn't have that capability of blowing that siren. And uh, there were a lot of people in Napanee that were pretty upset because we don't blow that siren anymore. So. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the siren's still up there. It's uh-huh. still up on the post. Yeah. It, it's pretty cool to watch the, uh, or actually not watch because I wouldn't have been alive in like 1892 when the fire department first started, but like the progression of pictures from when they went from the fire bell on top of the hardware store in the center of town to four different fire bells to then the sirens so it yeah it's a pretty interesting like evolution if if i'm not mistaken i believe down at Westside park mm-hmm. uh one of the original fire bells is still on a post down on Westside park if if i'm not mistaken unless it's been moved yeah but, i think there's one there and we have one here okay and uh we ring it for the second graders okay but every so often you'll hear it a guest will ring it and so you'll hear and it's really loud yeah so you hear it no matter where you are yeah in the museum yeah i think um i've i've heard stories and this was before my time but i think when maybe it was the bell or the fire whistle would blow the fire siren would blow they would take one of the fire trucks and take it to the center of the square, and that's where the fire guys jumped onto the truck, and then oh. they responded to the fire from there. I, I can't <laughs> verify that, but I think that some of the guys have talked about that in the department. So yeah. some of the older guys that have retired. So if you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. All right. Well, thank you so much for sitting, taking time out of your schedule and sitting down with me to do this. I 
I appreciate you and all the work that you've done with NAFNI and the fire department. So. Well, I appreciate you asking me, and I appreciate all the things that you do for NAFNI to preserve the history of it and um, just taking care of the museum for us and taking care of our food car that we have on loan <laughs> to you guys. So. Yeah. It, it's, a popular, it's a popular thing, and I always have to let people in on the secret, and I, I, I just... It's just really hard to let them in on the secret of it. Well, <laughs> since since you're letting them in on the secret, um, and if anybody wants to, they can visit the museum and they can find <laughs> out the secret of it because it was an article in Popular Mechanics back yeah. a long time ago. So mm -hmm. um, the story on the food car is, I think, um, down in Francisville, Indiana, this guy invented this thing, and he was a inventor and stuff. He came he came up with this and. He put some kits together, and I think, if my numbers are right, he came. They, he built seven of them, mm -hmm. and we have one that is built. Yeah. And I think that there was one of them that was destroyed in a fire, so there may only be six of these foo cars that are in existence. I may be wrong on that, but that's the story that we've been told. So Yeah, I, I think so. We had some guests come in one time and they're like, that thing is out is on display outside of a steakhouse in Colorado. Oh. And we're like, what? <laughs> uh, we had a guy come in and he went a beeline straight to it. He must have like, because when you Google Fukar, our, our Fukar, your, mm -hmm. the fire department's Fukar is the first one that comes up and um, he made a beeline for it. He was looking under it. He was trying to open all the engine compartments, and he was going to build one. I don't know if he ever did or not, but... Okay. Yeah. Um, Smoky Stover is really pretty popular, and, um, and somehow a lot of people tie that to our department. And mm -hmm. um, even across the nation... Um, and I think it goes back to Fred Culp. Fred Culp would go down to Arizona in the winter. And down in Phoenix, Arizona, there is a fire museum. And um, they have requested some of our Smoky Stover stuff that we've come up with. Um, mm -hmm. Through the years, we've done different things and put Smoky Stover on it. Just And basically, it's just a promotional thing that we do for the members of the department. Um, whether it be Christmas gifts or, you know, we'll, every once in a while we'll we'll get together with and come up with something that everybody wants and we'll mm -hmm. put Smoky Stover on it. Um, but um, I think it was for our 100th anniversary we came up with a, a, a plate and it's got some pictures of the trucks on it with the Smoky Stover logo on it and uh, Phoenix Museum wanted some of those things so that they could put them on display so we have uh, given some of our extra stuff to them we've done uh, Christmas balls with the smoky stover on it and mm -hmm. we've done just different things that we give to the members of the department so we sort of hold that and cherish that just to the members of the department but every once in a while you know things get out and we see yeah. smoky stover stuff on the internet for sale <laughs> and ebay so um, I, I, we we have one of those plates in the collection <laughs> i don't know i i don't know how we got it but we we do have one of those plates i think those i think we may have sold those during for the 100th anniversary so 100th or 100, I forget what it was. Mm -hmm. I think it was 100th anniversary. All right. Oh, well, and and it is it is pretty interesting how popular Smoky Stover is and still is out there. So, um, and we always tell people that they can't have a food car. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> the interesting thing is this goes back to when Mayor Thompson was in in office. Um, he came to me one time and said, "Hey." He said, uh, I need to take you someplace. He never told me where we were going. We ended up going down to Warsaw to an auction. He says, we are going to buy this. I don't care how much it costs your department to get this, but uh, we're going to buy this. So we <laughs> went down there, and we ended up buying this food car. And uh, 
Uh, I don't really remember exactly how much we paid for it, but we thought we were crazy at that time for paying that much money for it. But we're glad that we have it now. So <laughs> yeah. it's in our possession and it'll remain in our possession. <laughs> so it was money well invested. Yeah, it, it is a popular topic. And we always tell them that the only time that it's ever on its nose is when it's up on its furniture movers and we have to move it. Yep. So. Yep. So. But um, just want to thank you again for asking me. And um, like I said, we all of them, all the members of the department, both fire and EMS, um, enjoy serving the community. And we just want to make Napanee Fire Department the best that we can make for the community. And we just enjoy serving the community. Yeah. Well, thanks again. You're welcome. Well, that's all we have for this episode. A big thank you to Don and Steve for joining me and being my guest. Next month, we're talking to Chris Gillum about the historic Daniel Stump Farm. But before you go, be sure to subscribe to this podcast, hit like, or leave us a comment.